Welcome to GeoInteresting, presented by the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. GeoInteresting sat down with John Davies, a lifelong map collector, and Alex Kent, PhD, Professor of Cartography and Geographic Information Sciences at Canterbury Christ Church University in the United Kingdom. The map-loving duo spoke about their comprehensive collection of detailed Soviet maps and how the USSR secretly mapped the world throughout the 20th century. First, I want to ask, were the Soviets better at cartography than the U.S. and Great Britain? (laughs) (laughs) Question. I don't think they were better, but I think they had different emphasis. I I think, first of all, I think that geodesy and cartography is very much part of the Russian soul. It goes with the vastness and wilderness of their empire and of their mathematical bent. Mm -hmm. So I think they they were good at it anyway. I think they had a a different objective in mapping (coughs) in the 20th century, Mm -hmm. which was not so much as invasion maps or or even as military maps per per se, Mm -hmm. but as a way of cataloguing the whole world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when we look at these maps, we find all kinds of details which are irrelevant to a military endeavour, but are very, very useful for civil law, all of the purposes where you, we've called it, and Alex has called it like a Wikipedia of the world, Mm -hmm. where you gathered the information. So not better, but different, different purpose. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a very good question. I think also Mm. it's uh, building on what John's saying. I think, to this whole idea of wanting to hold together, using maps as a sort of repository of all this information and comparing them perhaps these maps with um, maybe the, the British or the, the American or NATO versions, you know, it seems to be very uh, very much more comprehensive than perhaps the, you know, the allied versions if you like, so mm-hmm. it's as if ours in inverted commas, you know, were all about really trying to make sure that what we were doing was fit for purpose perhaps, had much more you know, refined specific uses in mind perhaps, whereas the Maybe the Soviet maps were much more comprehensive as they wanted to sort of gather everything together so that then they could be used for lots of different purposes. But two sort of different ends of the we're same spectrum. We're going to show some examples today of mm-hmm. side by side. Yeah. And it's apparent when you look at that, the different purposes of these maps. Okay. Yeah. And can you just discuss some of those? What do you think they used them for? I mean, they, they went into such detail, um, you know, down to like mapping bus stations mm-hmm. yeah. and and like why did you think it was a priority for that kind of mm. detail and I know you'll go into this in your presentation mm. but it can only be we can only speculate mm. how <laughs> on earth can we know what, mm. what they intended however the fact that this was funded gra- you know, on a grand scale for a very long period of time means it doesn't it doesn't associate itself with any particular military initiative or objective Mm. (coughs) the way I've expressed it when people Mm. have asked this sort of question is an assumption that eventually communism will prevail across Mm. the world that would be a sort of mindset of of the regime Mm -hmm. and when it does naturally the USSR will be in charge because they're the the leading brand Mm -hmm. Mm. and if you're going to be in charge of the world then you need to know where the police stations are and the bus stops are and the water facilities and the electric facilities. You need to know that information. And it's all been collected up, ready for the day when it's needed. And I say these do not associate themselves with any particular military you know, um, <coughs> invasion or or objective yeah, in that yeah. sense. I mean, the amount of attention that's given to infrastructure, whether it's you know, still in use or not, especially, you know, there's something again we'll touch on the talk, but... You know, you have disused railways, for example, mm-hmm. lots of other types of transport that have been there and gone, trams, you know, this sort of thing. So again, it's almost really transportation, important. yes, yeah, I indeed. Think that's one of the things that I would pick out. Yeah. Transport yeah. facilities, particularly railways, mm-hmm. are there on the maps if they ever existed. Mm. And so you get this asynchronous thing of, of a railway on the map alongside the road that replaced it, or a mm. ferry across a river alongside the bridge which replaced it. So they know the bridge is there. But they also show the ferry. Yeah. So all these these linking these these communications facilities, clearly that was important, and you documented it. And it looks mm. also almost as if you never took anything off a map. Once you put it on a map, it stayed there. Mm. And then, uh, <coughs> yeah. I mean, again, as if the maps were this sort of repository. You know, yeah. if it was mm. known, it went on the map. Yeah. That's the thing. And it could be revived yeah. if, if railway railways. I think in Russia, 
are particularly important. That's the, the, long, the main medium of transportation. Mm -hmm. And if a railway line ever existed, it could be resurrected, presumably. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in Britain, and certainly in America, there are many disused railway lines. In the period of the 1960s, 70s, 80s, we were replacing them by roads. Mm -hmm. But they still, they're still ostensibly exist. Mm -hmm. Right. Excellent. So during the Cold War, what do you think was the primary difference in cartographic st strategy between the Soviets, the Ordnance Survey, and the Defense Mapping Agency? Hmm. Much more goal orientated, perhaps, yeah. when it comes to, let's say, the, the Western countries. Put it I like mean, for that, you know. well, just one example. Mm. So the Ordnance Survey, for example, mm. shows political boundaries. Mm. And they're quite important. So voting constituencies, mm -hmm. county councils, borough councils, all those boundaries are on. The Russians take the same map and ignore all of that mm. because that's not significant. So you're, you're mapping, as we've said before, you're mapping for a purpose. Mm. And boundaries were not important. Mm -hmm. mm. Likewise, on American maps, you would get the name of the railroad. That's quite important. So all the railways have got the name of the company that operates the trains mm -hmm. or the whole infrastructure. You can look at the Russian map, which is a direct copy of the American map in some cases, but that name doesn't exist because that name's irrelevant. So, mm. you know, the maps are there for, for the users, mm -hmm. mm. and the Russian cartographer would know that the user doesn't want to know that. They'd left, mm. left it off, although they mm. could have put it on. Right. Because they knew it. It could have been there, but they chose not to. Mm. Yeah, that whole idea of selectivity, you know, something which you see much more prevalent, let's say, Ordnance Survey and so on, Again, wanting to choose what's important for the user and putting mm -hmm. that on, you know, I think our maps, let's put it that way, were much more selective, and maybe the Soviet maps were much more comprehensive. You know, mm -hmm. anything had a potential use that could be. You, you might see it that, and we'll, we'll look at some examples actually mm -hmm. in the talk. But you can look at a, a Western map as being a way of finding your way around. Mm -hmm. If a if a soldier had this map, or a member of the civilian public had the map, they would find their way to where they're going. The Russian map is more explaining where you are and what's mm. here. It isn't so easy. Mm. It is because of the amount of information. It isn't quite so easy to find your way around because that's not its purpose. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. We'll look at you know we'll mm. both come out in the talk and we, we can talk about this when we right. show the pictures. Mm. But yeah, that touches <coughs> on the just massive influx of data now. Mm. Everything is getting getting yeah. um mm. getting photographed or mapped. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Okay, so we've talked about the sort of past, now move to the present or the future. How has the emergence of higher resolution satellite imagery and more commercial imagery capability improved and weakened modern day cartography? That's on for you. <laughs> and weakened <laughs> modern day cartography, yes, that's a very good question. I think, you know, one of, you know, just, just tacking this from a sort of very broad perspective. I think, you know, perhaps there is an expectation of imagery to deliver when it comes to, or high resolution imagery when it comes to particular uses, you know, specific uses. People want to maybe, well, get the idea that the image will do everything for them, whereas maps, of course, interpret the landscape so they can be made much more selective, generalised and so on, so people can use them for different purposes. And I think maybe, you know, again, we've had, you know, digital globes, for example, haven't we? You know, there's a whole, you know, host of the different ways in which the world is presented to people. And I think that has changed the way, let's say, people look at maps, maybe expect different things of maps. I think if you look at the, maybe the upshot of that, you see how, uh, you know, other corporations have used... Uh, very simple maps to try and convey the message, you know, navigational maps, you know, lots of different examples which you'll know of, of course, mm -hmm. as well. Maybe people, again, are sort of seeing much more of a difference between the richness of detail in imagery and the simplicity of mapping. And whether that's, um, you know, in a way that's kind of strengthened and weakened the case of, of cartography. Again, there's much more that can be done now. People are sort of relearning <coughs> maybe the, mm -hmm. the importance of good cartography, but at the same time, Again, you know, there's so much more that can be learnt from a map that isn't necessarily there. I think something else which is, uh, I think, very important as well is that a map can tell you something of a place without having to be there, you know, in terms of you know, how it's shown in terms of landmarks, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. An image presents sort of everything together, but it doesn't have that, 
you know, that way in. You can explore a map much more perhaps than you can an image. An image sort of presents everything. It, it sort of makes it a bit of a closed book for you, if you see what I mean. With a map, you can imagine much more, maybe. Maybe that's where it, it mm -hmm. leads. I'd, I'd make a, a similar point. That mm. In the sort of 10 or 15 years since these maps, 15 or 20 years perhaps, since these maps emerged, <coughs> people's expectations of what you can see have changed. So mm. it, it astonished people that, that the Russians had gathered this information mm. because we'd never seen Google Maps. Mm -hmm. Now anybody can go to their computer and look at Google Earth or Google Maps or many others, you can see anywhere. And so it's not astonishing now to see a map of a, a falling city. It, would, mm. it was astonishing. And so part of the wow factor of these maps has gone because, well, so what? <laughs> they had to do it the hard way. Mm -hmm. These were done the hard way. <laughs> now mm. any of us can sit at our PC and look at anything. Yeah, I think, so that's, I think it, that's a very it, good point in terms of is. retrospectively looking at where these maps were. The it's, yeah, very the difficult. The place. Very difficult to imagine what it was like back then these creating maps these maps in the seventies, so on. Yeah. Are, are, have an information on them that would have been astonishingly difficult to collect. Mm -hmm. mm. Now we can sit and do it and think, well, so what? You know, it's mm. there. It's easy. Mm. Mm. And also, that's changed. If I can, I think it's relevant to this. It's changed the significance of these maps for modern map makers because certainly in Britain, when these first emerged, mm. they were potentially could have been used by commercial map makers who previously were paying license fees to the Ordnance Survey. Mm. And Ordnance Survey suddenly spotted that a major revenue source mm -hmm. could disappear. These maps mm. at that point were sufficiently recent mm. that you could, even if you didn't copy them, you could get the information from them and the geospatial layout and so on. You didn't have to rely on Ordnance Survey anymore. Mm. Now that's changed again because uh, because of other sources mm. of information, and also because the maps themselves are now out of date, as it were. They're forty or fifty years old, not not, not recent. But at the time, the Ordnance Survey reacted uh, spectacularly uh, to to kill off the trade in Britain because map makers, commercial map makers, suddenly said, "Wow, you know, here is what we need: the raw material." to make a tourist map or a street map or something of our, that otherwise is hard to do. Yeah, yeah. But interesting, I mean, you all remember this as well. This whole idea of Ordnance Survey clamping down, in a way, was very much to do with the topographic maps, wasn't it? The topo maps, as opposed to the city plans, which is, again, the distinction we'll draw later on today when we do our talk, mm -hmm. where, again, you know, the emergence of, let's say, another level of detail, another level mm -hmm. of data, when we're looking at the mapping of foreign cities, that really is very astonishing compared to perhaps yeah. what we see with the topographic maps. So, again, it's very interesting that even then, you know, mm -hmm. this is, I think, 90, was it 97, something yeah, like that? Or late 90s, even then, there was but still suspect, more to discover, I think. Yeah, I suspect they only mentioned topographic maps because they didn't know about the... Well, that's, that's what I think, yeah, yeah indeed, I yeah, think, I agree. I think yeah. That, that yeah. Yeah. it was so little was known about them, Yes. And yeah. they were so yeah. scary. Yeah. The Ordnance Survey at that time had just won a £20 million pound lawsuit against the AA, which is a motoring organisation, mm. who'd been producing motorist maps using in copyright, well, as it turns out, using in copyright uh, OS material. Oh. And they just won £20 million. Pounds. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Mm. And so they were hot on the trail of where can mm. people like the AA get this material. Cause mm. You couldn't, you can't do it yourself. You have mm -hmm. to fly, you know, you have to fly or commission mm. expensive surveys. Mm -hmm. um, so suddenly this potential source of, a sort of out mm. of copyright material, but who knows whether it was or not out of copyright, that's another whole question, yeah. <laughs> which we'd prefer not to go into. But I think that highlights another point, doesn't it, very much so, about the value of mapping, in that again, you know, you're talking about mm. looking retrospectively. The fact that this was such a, an issue back then. Today, perhaps it's, it's much less of an issue. Yeah. Open street map, for example, yeah, well, very much like a, a sort of global counter map, global yeah. Wikipedia right. map. Very different in terms of how you actually get geospatial information today as opposed to the situation it was sort of 20 years ago, 30, on 30 years ago. Phone, exactly. And, and everything exactly. you get is it's linked accessible. with geographic data, mm -hmm. even just where the coffee shops yeah. are, you know, yeah. the advertising, everything's linked right. to maps. Maps are part of people's consciousness. Mm. Which they weren't. So mm -hmm. much, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Do you answer the question? <laughs> yes, <laughs> for sure. I know we, we have these kids come in from high schools, even, and 
they're using ArcGIS and yeah, doing yeah, these yeah. different projects of, yeah. you know, and it's, it's really cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think, yeah, that's pretty cool. So, my favorite question. What are some of the more striking details you've encountered on these Soviet maps? And do you have a particular favorite map? <coughs> okay, the striking detail. Mm. Again, it's what it's the kind of thing we've been talking about. A bridge, for mm. instance, will be annotated with the height above the river, you know, clearance under the bridge, the carrying capacity of the bridge, what material it's made of. That is amazing to have discovered that. Uh, and so it's details like that that fascinate you and, and draw you into these maps. And think, why, how did they get this information? Why did they think they needed to know it? Mm -hmm. and, and, and any number of examples like that. Mm. And, and, and what's really interesting is to compare maps of the Western world, so London or you know, so on, mm. with maps of their own territory. So we're going to show today a map of Vilnius, which was... It's not the capital of Lithuania, actually. It's just the biggest city in Lithuania, isn't it? Because Kaunas is the capital. I think Vilnius is the, is the capital, isn't it? And no, Kaunas Kaunas. Is the Oh, OK, the other way around. <laughs> anyway, way. but yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. We're not very good on geography. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're going to show a map of Vilnius in Lithuania. It is in Lithuania. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah. But and a small section of this map is annotated with, I don't know, about 100 pieces of information. So there's a bit of forest, and it will tell you the clearance between the forests, the girth and height of the trees, and which ones are spruce and which ones are aspen. Wow. Mm. It will show you what is the material of the bed of the river. Mm. Oh. It's a sandy bed on this river. It will tell you how fast the river is flowing. It will tell you the height of the embankment of the river. It will tell you there's a pedestrian mm. underpass, and what is the height and size of this pedestrian underpass mm. on the so mm. those, and the more you look at these mm. maps, and the more of this obsessively detailed information. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, and so the favourites really are those where you've got all of that in a small bit, and you can just revel in the richness of all of this. Mm. And the other way of looking at a favourite is, the more local knowledge you have, mm. the more you can interpret the maps. When you look at somewhere, if I look at a map of London, Mm. I can get more out of it than looking mm. at the map of Washington because mm -hmm. I don't know what's intriguing or different. I can't find mistakes mm. as easily. Mm. So your, your favourites are always going to be somewhere. I grew up in the city of Bradford in the north of England and the Bradford map, I have to say, is my all-time favourite because mm. there's things on there that I didn't know about my native city. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. There's things I did not know about my native city mm. and it's things like place names. So that's very intriguing. <coughs> Place names of a, of a district <coughs> are not definitive. People use a word, you know, use a name. Uh, maybe map makers pick up names of areas or districts. They don't have boundaries and they don't have fixed definitions. Mm -hmm. So different map makers over the years have used different descriptions for places. And this Bradford map, because I know what names to expect, and I looked at the names on the map, and I could identify 12 different Ordnance survey maps or the equivalent street city plans that have been used because going right back to the 1850s or 1860s, the first large scale ordnance survey map has a district called Junction. Oh, I thought <laughs> such place as Junction, and no other map has it. But that ordnance survey map of 1860 has it, and it's on the Russian map. Mm. That yeah. they had to have that mm. map because you didn't get it from anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And I've looked at all the maps in the British Library or in mm -hmm. other collections of Bradford. There aren't all that many, really, over in, even over a couple of hundred year period. You know, new editions get released of Ordnance Survey mm -hmm. and a few commercial map makers make maps. Mm -hmm. And they all start from, either start from what's already there or start from mm -hmm. uh, local, you know, local mm -hmm. exploration and so on. Mm -hmm. And as yeah. time evolves, they do it differently and they name things differently. Mm -hmm. And so those that Bradford map, which has got yeah, identified mm -hmm. the twelve different sorts. Of the <laughs> so, in the, and that, so what that's telling you is they squirrelled up. You know, they, they've they've gathered mm. armfuls 
it wasn't just going into in, St in London we call it Stanford's the big map shop in London Stanford, mm. that we would say you just went into Stanford's and bought one of everything <laughs> well probably they did go into Stanford's and buy one of everything but that's only today's maps mm. <laughs> they did to go way way back yeah. so that's, that's an yeah. impressive amount of effort yeah, I think for me, I mean, it's very interesting that question about the detail and so on. Something I really enjoy looking at is how the buildings have been classified. So, for example, the, the city plans, which are large scale maps of towns and cities, probably about 2,000 around the world. I mean, John's already mentioned Bradford, of course, you know, that sort of thing. You know, how the buildings that are strategically important have been classified and then coloured. So, for example, you've got green for military buildings. Mm -hmm purple for sort of communications and administrative buildings, governmental and black for military industrial buildings, that sort of thing. If you know somewhere yourself, like I'm from Dover for example in Kent, there's a, a map a plan of Dover, mm -hmm. and if you look as John was saying, at somewhere that you know that you're familiar with, and you see how someone else, a potentially hostile enemy let's say, has classified and interpreted your landscape that you're familiar with, not only is the Cyrillic striking let's say so it looks like an alien landscape but also again these buildings that are seen in a very very different way to which you might otherwise look at them that sort of thing and again you know just picking on the local knowledge as well this whole idea about what you might learn from the maps that you might not otherwise know so in Dover for example there was a an aerial cableway that used to carry coal from the coal field nearby in Tilmanstone through the cliffs through the white cliffs of Dover down basically the, the harbour arm and up, like, offload the coal straight onto a, a ship. And this finished, I think, in the 50s, something like that. And the plan of Dover is from 1974 and still shows mm. this cableway coming through the cliffs. Now, I never knew that was there, for example. Mm -hmm. But obviously, you know, the Soviet Union, you know, the cartographers found this out, put it on the map, and it's still there present on the map. So, again, that whole meaning of, of what a landscape is, that's something that jumps out at you. Again, this it's a fluid concept it's not mm -hmm. necessarily preserved in stone and you can always learn something from these maps I think that's one of the, the big things about them really. Alex mentioning Dover mm. reminds me of the other interesting aspect about these maps which is that these are all original research compared with mm. the German so yeah that's right so, that's so, right so the Germans mm. in preparation for a potential invasion in World War II mm -hmm. in the 1940s took British six inch to the mile maps mm -hmm. ordnance survey freely available and they photo reduced and enlarged mm -hmm. to one to ten thousand yeah. mm -hmm. and then overprinted them so you can look at a german invasion map and you see that is recognizably the same map as the british map mm -hmm. photo reproduced to a metric scale and then overprinted with information in german and with their strategic objectives so that's quite interesting but then compare that with the russian map the russian map looks nothing like Mm. Then. Mm. It's a fundamental resurvey, isn't it's it? A, it's a re fundamental, so it's, so yeah. that, you know, Radical the difference. German one was an invasion map. It was for a particular purpose. Mm. Mm. And then the easy and quick way to do it was to mm. nab the British one and, and mm. just convert it the way you want it. Mm. Very, very different <laughs> approach. Right. Mm. Mm. Oh, that's pretty cool. But I, think, I think it also highlights, you know, maps are very personal as well and something as well that comes mm. up in the talk. <coughs> The maps, certainly the plans, used to have the, the names, for example, of the cartographers involved, you know, the editors and mm -hmm. so on. And again, you know, it's easy to forget that. We think that these you know, maps are sort of almost produced you know, by no one, you know, mm -hmm. they're unauthored, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And so we forget sometimes that, again, people are behind people. cartography, and it's, it's good to make that, you know, be reminded of that, I think. Geo Interesting is produced by the Office of Corporate Communications. Never miss an episode by subscribing on iTunes or SoundCloud. You can also follow NGA on Twitter and like us on Facebook. Thanks for listening. <laughs>